with the first speech for the morning is the number 7 speech uh, ceramah nombor 7 tajuknya uh, ini dalam bahasa Inggeris eh? response to the allegations that the Holy, Prof Holy Quran advocates violence this will be presented by uh, Ayas Mahmud Saib of uh, Majlis Samla Singapore uh, the translation in Malay menjawab tuduhan-tuduhan bahawa Al-Quran mengajar kekerasan ini akan disampaikan oleh Tuan Ayas Mahmud Ahmad uh, Majlis Samla Singapura Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wahdahu la sharika lahu wa ashhadu anna Muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluhu amma ba'du fa'uzu billahi minash shaitanir rajim Bismillahirrahmanirrahim And when they hear vain talk, they turn away from it and say, Unto us our works, and unto you your works. Peace be to you, we seek not the ignorant. Surely thou wilt not be able to guide all whom thou lovest, but Allah guides whomsoever he pleases, and he knows best those who would accept guidance. From chapter 28, verses 56 to 57. Respected chairman, distinguished guests, brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. How many of us here have seen anti Islamic propaganda online on our smartphone? What do you do or how do you feel when you see that? It seems that even if you are neutral to this party, there is little room to escape the constant bombardments of articles, blogs, WhatsApp messages, Facebook posts which are anti-Islamic in nature, Instagram posts, the list is endless. Some of you I'm sure probably do not feel confident to respond to such allegations perhaps because you lack the knowledge or simply lack the time to research for the right answers. Through this little device, which we all know is the smartphone, you can have access to knowledge. Gone are the days when we had to go to the library or go pick up encyclopedias or buy newspapers. Everything now is digitalized. Knowledge has come to our fingertips. It gives us the latest news, updates, just within a matter of seconds. It gave birth to a new era of article writers, bloggers, some of which have hundreds and thousands of followers. Even people now have their own YouTube channels where they have millions of subscribers. It has become a global village where we are now more connected than ever before. When you mix this phenomena, with the latest terror attacks carried out in the name of Islam. And you will see this every day on Facebook posts. The result is a massive polarization of views. It seems everybody has an opinion on the subject. Google, Google scholars rise to the surface and everyone wants to say something about the topic. However, human nature tells us that most will not lead, most will follow. They will not research for themselves. The vast majority will follow their idols or their scholars on social media, and they will influence others without knowing what they are following, but they will encourage people to follow them. It would also be very easy for a layman after reading an article or a book that is written against the Quranic teachings, let's say it gets 10,000 likes, and the article is well written in the sense that maybe they've supported it using some uh, Quranic verses, along with the usual rhetoric that comes with it. 
it would be very difficult for a layman to think that Islam teaches anything but violence. How many of us have been on the receiving end of these kind of things? These endless allegations, perhaps we haven't faced them face to face, but I'm sure we can all agree that these are posts that we see on social media. The Islam today is being attacked from all directions, from all over the world. It has got to the stage where even politicians and presidents like Donald Trump, they are tw he's tweeted some very negative things about Islam. And what are we to do about that? Take another example. There's a, a, a guy called Geert Wilders in, uh, in Holland. He's a member of the Dutch parliament. He has written a book against the Quran and has tried to support those allegations, quoting certain verses from the Quran. In fact, not just him, but thousands of people have tried to level cherry pick allegations against the, the holy founder of Islam, the Quran, and the religion itself. It certainly would not be an exaggeration to say that if all the literary works that have ever been written against Islam, against the Quran, or against the character of the Prophet Muhammad wasallam, if they, all of that literature was piled up, we, nothing less than a mountain would emerge. In the current era, we do not see such wars that took place in, in the early part of Islam. In the early part of Islam, Islam was attacked because it believed in the one true God. It was attacked purely for being Islam. Critics of Islam are using very different, very, very new methods. They are using social media platforms. And by using that, they are able to uh, reach millions, millions of people on their smartphones. They are writing articles and they're writing it in a way that appeals to the general public. In essence, the critics are no longer using their swords. They are only using their pens. They are using their own self, their words. As law-abiding citizens, as law-abiding Muslims, it is our responsibility to not let our emotions get in the way. Rather, we should be able to respond to such baseless allegations with love, with peace, and intellect. And we should also respond with the pen. It is therefore my task today to refute the allegation that the Quran teaches violence. Today, my, my objective is to help everyone understand our response to say, let's three main allegations written against the Quran. I hope by the end of this discourse, every single one of you will understand how to respond. If you are not a Muslim, then how to at least appreciate the verses of the Quran better. I will start with apostasy in Islam. As you know, in Pakistan, some Muslim clerics, they preach death for apostasy. And those who do not know, Ahmadi Muslims are considered apostates, and they are called deserving of death. This is openly taught and preached by those clerics on live TV. And there are YouTube videos out there calling for death of Ahmadi Muslims for everybody to see. We see many Islam's critics use that to convince others that this is in fact the true teachings of Islam. But what does the Quran say about this? And does the Quran really teach death for apostasy in Islam? What happens if someone leaves Islam according to the Quran? Secondly, I will talk about the war verses in the Quran. But what was the philosophy behind those verses? And why were they revealed? And were they in fact even necessary? And thirdly, I will talk about the punishments for crimes. Does Islam really teach stoning for adultery? And why should hands be cut off for stealing? Isn't that just inhumane? All three topics have a link to violence and therefore is subject to much debate and discussion over social media. And perhaps you will have faced these questions in your so-called circles already. Now, if you ever hear any extremist cleric or indeed a critic of Islam allege that there is death for apostasy in Islam, let me make it absolutely crystal clear from the outset, nowhere, and I mean nowhere in the Quran, is there any remote mention of this? You should be confident about this and not let anyone tell you anything different. Quran teaches absolutely no force in the matters of religion. In Surah Al-Baqarah, verse 257, it says very clearly, 
la ikraha fid din which means there is a, there is no compulsion in religion we are all free to believe whatever we want we can be atheists we can be secularists we can be jews christians hindus we can follow any belief system for that matter at the end no one can force us on matters of faith and this is something that comes straight from the heart ultimately the matter is between the almighty allah and that person islam even goes so far that we are not even allowed to pass a judgment that somebody is going to hell at the end the decision of salvation and the decision of reward and punishment lies with allah and we have no right to kill someone for their faith we even do not have the right to claim that an atheist will go to hell allah is most merciful he is most gracious he is the master of the day of judgment and if he wants to forgive an atheist for some other good that he has done then that's his will and he will do it and if he wants to punish somebody for being an atheist then that's his decision who are we to say anything else get wilders who i mentioned earlier has written a book which i will refer to during this discourse he talks about a lady who left islam and writes by renouncing her islamic faith i will say sorry and i quote by renouncing her islamic faith she had committed apostasy ultimate crime in islam for which the quran prescribes the death penalty once you're islamic you are never allowed to leave End quote. This is from page 8 of his book, Marked for Death. Now, Mr. Wilders claims to have read the Quran multiple times. However, let me tell you a fact. Nowhere does the Quran prescribe death for apostasy. Whereas Wilders, Wilders fails to give even a single verse in support of this patently false accusation, primarily because there isn't one, I will go ahead and show a couple of places in the Quran that can easily refute this. Let's start with Surah Al-Baqarah, verse 128, which starts like this, and I quote it. I'll just quote the start. And whoso from among you turns back from his faith, dot, dot, dot. Now, what should we read after this sentence? What should we read? If Quran teaches death for apostasy, then surely we should read something like hunt him down, kill him. Because he's left his faith, right? But there's absolutely no, no mention of this. Instead, we read something very different. So I'll go back to the verse and complete it. And whoso from among you turns back from his faith and dies while he is a disbeliever, it is they whose works shall be in vain in this world and the next. Zero mention of death. Zero mention. However, some extremists or clerics who argue with us uh, on this point they will say that the word here doesn't say dies it says kill they say it, the word is used kill this is another feeble attempt to mislead innocent people those who understand arabic know very well that the word used here is yamut which means dies whereas if the verses was talking about killing someone killing someone it would have revealed the word kutila which means to kill Another, another verse to support this is in the next chapter, chapter 4, verse 138. It says that those who believe and then disbelieve, then again believe and then again disbelieve, dot, dot, dot. This is from chapter 4, 138. Now, why does the Quran say those who again believe? Why does it start by saying those who believe and then disbelieve then again and then believe and then disbelieve? Why does it give these options? According to Geert Wilders and other Islamic extremists, after the initial apostasy, they should already have been killed. Such are the arguments that are used against the beautiful and peaceful teachings of the Quran. Let me make it clear. Of course, no religion on this planet wants its followers to leave. Islam is exactly the same. It encourages everybody to stay on the one true path, on the Sarat al-Mustaqim. But if a person wants to leave, if he wants to become a Jew or a Christian or a Hindu or an atheist, then that is outside of our jurisdiction. 
and it's outside of any jurisdiction of human beings here. It's between him and his maker. Let's now move on and talk about some of the war verses. This is the second part of my speech. This is used very fondly by our fellow extremists, um, not our fellow extremists, sorry, our extremists um, and our fellow uh, brothers who often say that um, there is possibility for violence in the Quran. First, we are in absolute agreement with all parties concerned that during the early days of Islam, wars were fought and people did die. Muslims died and non-Muslims died as well. However, before branding Islam as a warlike religion, we must first understand the context of those verses. We must understand the context of those wars as well. The early Muslims at the time of the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, accepted Islam and they were bitterly persecuted for no less than 13 years. Muslims were dragged through the streets. They were tortured in the burning hot sun. They had their limbs torn off one by one. There is a narration that uh, a Muslim was tied, his, his limbs, his arms and his legs were tied to horses and the horses were made to run in the opposite directions until the limbs were completely torn off. Why? Because they wanted him to say that there is no one God and Islam is a false religion. But no, they stayed on the true path. Because of this boycott, there was also a social uh, boycott for three years without access to food or water. This was implemented by the uh, Quraysh at the time of the Prophet. During this boycott, he lost his beloved wife and his uncle. The Muslims were stoned, they were ridiculed, they were spat at, they were emotionally, physically, and mentally abused. Despite that, not a single verse from the Quran was revealed to fight, not a single verse. And there was no verse commanding them to fight in over 13 years. Instead, Muslims were entering the religion, religion of Allah without any force. They were ordered to hold on firmly to the handle of the patience and remain firm in their belief in Allah. Given the Muslims were peaceful and law-abiding citizens of Mecca, when they were not able to practice their religion, they migrated to Medina peacefully. Here they tried to start a new life, but the enemies of Islam chased them and attempted to fight them and exterminate them. It was at this point when Allah revealed the verses which has been the subject of much discussion. And this is from Surah Al-Hajj, chapter 22, verses 40 and 41. It is highly probable that you will see critics use these verses to argue that Quran is a violent book. Some extremist Muslims also use these verses to recruit other extremists. Let me share with you these verses first and let you know what is the actual context. It starts with verse 40. Permission to fight is given to those against whom war is made because they have been wronged and Allah indeed has power to help them. Now if we read this verse on its own, you can be misled into thinking that Islam does allow you to fight you know, if you've been wronged or if, you, you know, if something uh, really bad has happened to you. And this is quite subjective. But verse 41 then expands this whole thing and, and explains the whole situation. It says, and I, and I carry on, those who have been driven out of their homes unjustly only because they said our Lord is Allah. And if Allah did not repel some men by means of others, they would surely have been pulled down cloisters and churches synagogues and mosques wherein the name of Allah is oft commemorated and Allah will surely help one who helps him. Allah is indeed powerful, mighty. From these verses we can see that the idolaters of Mecca had decided to exterminate the Muslims. In fact they didn't just want a war, they wanted everyone to follow idolatry in order to retain their control and hence they waged a war on every single person in Medina. If the Muslims did it, decided to sit back and not fight, it would have been as good as suicide. There were only two options left, either die or defend. As mentioned already, they already tried to run away, so they couldn't run away again. 
So, so either they had to accept the death of freedom of religion or to defend religious freedom by fighting back. This is the actual context of the verses. It was purely a defensive war and nothing else, only for the sake of ending cruelty and injustice. The permission was granted to stop those who wanted to seize the basic human rights and liberties of all people. It was to stop those who sought to destroy the very foundation of religious freedom. It was not only to protect Islam, but also to protect all religions and all forms of belief systems. It was to maintain religious freedom and freedom of conscience, and it was to uphold and protect religious sites like churches, synagogues, and temples, and mosques where God or Allah's name was worshipped. Remember the idolaters, they wanted to destroy monotheism, and so Islam, Christianity, Judaism, and other religions that worship the one true God was under the threat in exactly the same way. Based on the twisting of such verses, Wilders has called for a complete ban on the Holy Quran in Holland. He's labeled it a fascist book and arguing that it incites towards aggression and extremism. In addition to other verses, Wilders often presents the fifth verse of chapter nine as evidence that Islam calls for violence against Jews and Christians. You may have seen these verses on your smartphones, on social media platforms. Folks like David Wood in the US on YouTube, I know, has tried to mislead the masses on this. It is quite often his videos which get shared on social media by innocent uh, layman followers who have not researched properly themselves or didn't have the time. Without understanding the context, it is possible that even certain Muslims can become radicalized, which is why this subject is so important. The entire verse is as follows. And when the sacred months have passed, kill the idolaters where you find them and take them prisoners and beleaguer them and lie in wait for them at every place of ambush. But if they repent and observe prayer and pay the zakat, then leave their way. Surely Allah is most forgiving, merciful. This is from chapter 9, verse 5. His Holiness Mirza Masroor Ahmed, Amir al-Mu'mineen, Ayyadahullah Ta'ala bin Nasrih al-Aziz, head of the worldwide Ahmadiyya Muslim community has replied to Wilder's allegation directly by explaining that these verses concerns a very specific group. These, this group are idolaters who had committed treason. They had betrayed Muslims and broken a peace treaty with them and journeyed to Medina in an effort to kill them. Res Wilders tries to apply it to all non-Muslims for all times this is absolutely not the case. Please do also bear in mind that capital punishment for heinous crimes like treason is still pa uh, currently practiced in uh, the United States and in more than 50 other countries around the world. But please also take note that despite this grave offense, despite all of this, the Quran still gives the idolaters a respite period, a grace of four months to change their ways, to reconsider their behavior and seize those hostilities. Sadly, after the four months of this respite period, the enemies of Islam, they still continued their hostilities against the Muslims. It was only then, and only then when the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, was commanded by Allah to meet them in battle and defend Muslims and the religion of Islam. Despite deserving capital punishment, the God of Islam calls for mercy upon these heinous killers who repented, and then even the ones who accepted Islam during the sacred four months. Wilders then tries to make it appear as if this compassionate act is a call for conversion by force. Were an idolater to be forcibly convert, converted, it would contradict the Holy Quran, which states that there should be no compulsion in religion. I stated this verse earlier. This is from chapter two, verse 257, and for you, your religion, and for me, my religion, which is another verse of chapter 109, verse seven. So if there was force, and this was a compassionate act, then it would be prohibiting the conversion by force and, and establishing religious freedom. Finally, it must be emphasized that some critics like Wilders insist that this verse refers to Jews and Christians. In actual fact, 
the word idolaters is used. The word used in Arabic is al-mushrikeen. By definition, ex this excludes Jews and Christians. The Holy Quran has called Jews and Christians Ahl al-Kitab, or the people of the book, who were taught to believe in one God. And this verse is referring to al-mushrikeen, the idolaters, not Jews and Christians. Moving over to the last part of this discourse, I will be now talking about the punishment for crimes in Islam. How many of us have had to deal with a friend who asked us, why does Islam prescribe cutting of hands for stealing? Sometimes we see YouTube videos showing stonings of women by Taliban. I remember I always found it quite difficult myself to answer this question when my friends asked me about this topic when I was younger. Having researched this issue, I would like to share with you the background and the philosophy behind this so that you too can better explain this to your friends. So there are only four offenses which the Quran prescribes punishment for. One is adultery, two is slander, three is murder, and four is theft. Nothing else. These are also the four biggest crimes that dominate the social fabric and well-being of a society and are the cause of much suffering and misery we see in the world today and also in the past. The Quran is a book that provides solutions for these, not only for spiritual matters, but also gives solutions to social problems that exist in every society. The first thing to note is that the prescribed Quranic punishments are only valid if there is an Islamic state or an Islamic government. If we live in a secular government, these things do not apply. Second condition is that there should be a high level of morality and spirituality already in place in the state. According to Islamic Sharia and the law, an Islamic penal code cannot be enforced in, if the moral standard of that society is not being elevated. Simply just applying the Islam's penal code in a Muslim majority country without an effective effort to improve the moral and spiritual conditions of the citizens is not only ineffective, but also counterproductive. In other words, Islamic punishments cannot be enforced in any immoral society. And even if the society did elevate spiritual, in spiritual ways, it is really the decision of the government to decide whether to implement such punishments or not. What we see today with ISIS is the exact opposite. There is not even morality in their state, let alone spirituality. In the case of adultery, it is true that the Quran prescribes 100 lashes in accordance with the verse two five, uh, sorry, chapter 2, 4, verse 3. It, sta it reads as follows, the adulteress and the adulterer flog each one of them with 100 stripes. But before that punishment can be even given, the Quran also lays out some specific requirements in the following verse, which says, and this is chapter 24, verse 5, and those who calumniate chaste women but bring not four witnesses, flog them with 80 stripes and never admit their evidence thereafter. It is they that are the transgressors. For example, if someone claims that, that a person has committed adultery, he now needs to bring four witnesses who actually saw with their very own eyes the adultery take place between the two. In other words, all four should have been present and witnessed with their own eyes the act of intercourse. Secondly, these witnesses need to be considered highly moral and of unquestionable character. If they do not meet these requirements, then their testimony will not be considered. In other words, the Quran puts an extreme punishment, but also puts in place a heavy burden of proof on the one who is alleging the act. If he alleges that a chaste woman did unchaste things and is unable to bring his four witnesses, then that person will be flogged instead. This is the beautiful Quranic teaching that protects the honor and protects the integrity of the ones who are accused until it is proven beyond doubt. Sometimes you will hear some people say that stoning is permitted in Islam. These foul acts are perpetrated by so-called Muslims in Saudi Arabia or Afghanistan, and these have been shared widely on social media for everyone to see. How do you feel when you see this? And what is the real Islamic teaching here? It is, let me share with you, it is absolutely a complete myth to suggest that the Quran permits stoning. It is often criticized that the Quran and the Hadith uh, uh, permit 
stoning. However, this is not true. Nowhere in the Quran you will ever find stoning prescribed as a punishment. It is often related that the Prophet prescribed stoning in certain hadith. However, this was only because the person who committed the adultery was a Jew and, was, and when he was brought to the Islamic court, Prophet Muhammad وسلم, as a leader of the state and upon knowing that he was a Jew, asked this man, with which law would you want to be judged with? As a statement and a leader of Medina, he always gave the option to be dealt with according to the Quranic law or the Torah or any other law according to the faith of the individual, not imposing any religious views on the accused. He never enforced Islamic law on anybody. On this occasion, because this person was a Jew, he wanted to be judged according to the Torah. As such, he was stoned because this was the punishment prescribed in the Torah. If this person had been judged according to the Quranic law, he would have been flogged, not stoned, and four witnesses would have been required. But how do we respond to the punishment of cutting hands for stealing as prescribed in the Quran? To a layman, even some Muslims, this may sound very harsh. To help you understand this better, it is important to understand the limits proposed by Islam. For example, in the hadith, it is mentioned that there is no cutting off hands if someone steals an apple or fruits or any other food for sustenance. Also, if someone is on a journey and they had no money so that they had to steal, Islam does not prescribe cutting of hands as a punishment. Neither are they cutting of hands if someone takes more share from their trust or from a family inheritance. For all these, there are alternative punishments, but not the cutting of hands. So what is the point in cutting, and what, why, is the, why are cutting of hands allowed in Islam? We have to remember that the cutting of hands is imposed on a society where there is a high level of spirituality already in place, and that there is enough money in the system, through the economic system of Islam, through the means of like zakat to ensure that no one goes hungry and that all needs for the society are taken care of. Remember, in an ideal Islamic state, the economic system of Islam requires all Muslim citizens to pay zakat. They pay zakat from their retained earnings or their unspent income. That ensures that every single person in the, in the, in, in the, in the, in, in the town or country, anybody who needs any money, they will have enough money from the, from the state and will not go hungry or begging. However, if despite all of this, and despite having a high spiritual society and moral society, and despite having all uh, sufficient resources available to cover your daily necessary needs, and if an individual still wants to steal, and not, doesn't just do it once, he continues to do it as a, as a means of habit, that's when he is guilty of committing two serious offenses. First, he is not carrying out his obligations to the economy to work, and instead he steals. And secondly, he deprives others in society of their rightful possessions, which leads to economic stress and social anxiety. Only then, and only then, in such circumstances, Islam allows cutting off the hands to save the greater good of society from habitual thieves. What we see today is that terrorists or extremists have hijacked our religion, and anti-Islamic scholars or, or bigots have made situation even worse by inciting hatred towards Islam, erupting the sentiments of Muslims and non-Muslims all over the world. Not even <laughs> children are safe, as we saw recently where children were attacked in Manchester in the UK. Not just that, even the Grand Mosque of Mecca, where they tried to attack recently as well. As Ahmadi Muslims, we are working tirelessly to show the world the peaceful teachings of Islam. We will not fight with the swords. We will not fight with guns or bullets or bombs. We will instead shoot arrows of love and kindness. We will use bullets of intellectual persuasion and kindness to bring back the true Islam into the, te into the hearts of Muslims and non-Muslims alike. <laughs> we will write with our pens and highlight the beautiful teachings of Islam and will spread those articles or videos on your YouTube till everybody receives the counter-narrative highlighting the truth of the Quran and its teachings. 
The light of the Quran has always illumined many hearts over the years, and it continues to do so, and will continue to travel piercing through the hearts of all people for all times. However, if we believe the light of the media and draw our own conclusions or become Google scholars, you may find yourself looking at something that doesn't actually exist. I would invite you all to read the Quran with a critical lens and compare it with what you hear or see about Islam. Today, the Quran is a living book and a book that has been misquoted, misrepresented, and I hope you will all now understand that there is a deep philosophy in the teachings of the Quran. And although they may sound harsh if read without proper care, or if you're just reading just cherry pick parts, the reality is that the Quran teaches nothing but peace, respect, tolerance, loyalty to one's country, equality, and justice. The next time you hear something negative about the Quran, there is ample information out there defending the Quran, and that is the Quran itself. I invite you to read it. Thank you very much. Jazakumullah.